I come in. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to start sharing my screen in just a second. Oh, can everyone see that? Yes. Shaking of heads. I see shaking of heads. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We have a great program set up. We are continuing our series on Black Men's Health Matter with the Geisinger Bold ERG in partnership with the Black Scranton Project and the NAACP Wilkes-Barre Chapter. Today's speaker will be our very own Dr. Daryl McBride, and he will be discussing HIV and other STDs, statistics, treatment, and prevention with a focus on Black men's health. I'm very excited for this event, and I want to let everyone know that it is being recorded so it can be posted and enjoyed it after the session for people who aren't able to join us and for us if we want to watch it again. So I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Today, this event was created by the Bold Education Subcommittee. It was, it's always rewarding to put these um, events together along with my fellow members, Ms. Faith Bensa and Tamara Dickey and Dr. Vicki Tsap, who is our fearless leader. My name is Priscilla Cabral. I am, like I said, part of the Bold Outreach Leadership Development uh, Employee Resource Group here. I'm the co-chair of the Education Subcommittee. I'll be the moderator for today. So any questions that we have or comments, can we please put them in the chat so when the Q&A section comes at the end, we can have a lively discussion about what Dr. McBride has presented to us. We want to give a special thank you to the bold executive board members. Um, a lot of these projects and events that we do would not be possible without them. So we really appreciate their support. We also want to thank our marketing team who helps us put our events out there so people know to join us and to participate. We've had some great events thus far throughout the month of June. We have a few more going on. We have, I believe, four more speakers that are coming to speak for us. So we want to make sure that we register at least the day before for the events that you'd like to attend. Um, we also have a journal club going on every Tuesday in June and the first Tuesday of July around the Amend documentary series that is on Netflix. It's a great watch. Um, every journal club will be going through one of the episodes. We did the first two already. Um, so the next one will be next Tuesday and the episode we'll be discussing is the wait episode. I highly recommend if you're going to come to the event to watch the episode so that we can have a robust conversation about some of the deep topics that are discussed. I pre-watched it and it's amazing. So. I encourage everyone to watch the whole series, even if you can't come to the Journal Club. A little bit about our Black Outreach Leadership and Development ERG here at Geisinger. We have a great program that supports the, the Africans in the diaspora, and that's all cultures and ethnicities that fall under the umbrella of African descent. Bold accomplishes its mission by sharing data and stories that include experiences related to diversity, inclusion, equity, social justice, and belongingness. We host events that support his and her stories that represents its diverse work group and providing a professional, personal mentoring and sponsorship within the community and securing a pipeline of talent for upcoming strategic leadership positions. And we ask that all bold members take action by joining a subcommittee or trying to be a part of the events that go on throughout the year. Um, I, when I joined this a subcommittee, I've gotten great reward out of it. So I highly encourage it as well. And we have other employee resource groups here at Geisinger. We have the Women's Lead, G Pride, uh, VetNet and GAIN. Uh, these are just a few of them, but these are the contact information. If you're interested, please join or call 
any of these people will be glad to invite you into their employee resource group. Uh, this slide has a QR code for our giveaway that we have going on. We're going to be doing this at each one of our events. We have five giveaways per event. And if you register, please put your name first and last and an email address so we can be contacted. We also want to make sure if you register that we want to stay to the end of the event so that we can get the names correctly and make sure that we're getting the right prizes to the right people. Um, the, this link will be posted a few times throughout the event. If you miss it now, it'll be there. And uh, the QR code that's up also, you can scan that now if you'd like to and use that to register for the mug. I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Vicki T. Sapp. She'll be going over the Black Excellence featured spotlights that we have for the month. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Sapp. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So excited to have you here. I'm just going to spotlight our Black Excellent um, Mel's in Medicine. Um, Priscilla and Faith worked on this, and I'm so excited about the individuals they selected to highlight. Each event, we highlight one person. Next slide, please. Uh, on June 1, we highlighted, next slide, Dr. Tuxin. We highlighted Dr. Tuxin, next slide. And we're just gonna go through each of the slides until we get to today. Dr. Victor, go ahead. Dr. Mighty and Dr. Khalees is for today. And I'm so excited to introduce him. And you know, he served as the president and chief executive officer of the Charles R. Drew and I'm gonna come back to charge all Drew. He is also a, was also a physician, but I'm gonna highlight that because it resonated with me. And I'm so glad that I get to introduce Dr. Khalees. He has an MD and a PhD and very excited to know that he serves as the president and chief executive officer of the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science since 2011. He is, pub he is a published author and board certified internal medicine specialist. He graduated from Brown University with his medical degree, received the master's in um, public health and his PhD in health service research from UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. He has spent his clinical career revolved around caring for the underserved and he eventually went on to serve as a director of the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development for 11 years. He has been appointed to several committees, including the California Future Health Workforce Committee and Board of Trustees for the California Health Care Foundation. And I want us to celebrate him. When we look at the history of Black men in medicine, less than 2% in the country. And so I believe it is important for us to celebrate these men and their accomplishments and what they are doing, and also to highlight them and spotlight them so that we can encourage others. We can't be it if we don't see it. And we learned that from our feature Black Men documentary, Black Men in White Coat documentary that we showed during Black History Herstory Month. And so I wanna go back to Charles R. Drew and why this is so important to me that he is the president of this institution is because Charles R. Drew, he was also a medical doctor. He discovered blood plasm. And a lot of people don't know that. And another thing that really resonated with me about Charles Drew is he died from the very invention that he discovered because he was not allowed to go to the white hospital that was right next to where he needed blood. He needed a blood transfusion. The very discovery that he discovered and the white hospital would not take him. And they had to drive him far away. And by the time he got there, he died. And so just really understanding and knowing history and, and, and 
that Black people have discovered and did so much. And we have to unearth this and we have to educate people so that they understand the kings and the queens that are in our heritage and to be proud of that. And we have to be proud of that in everyone's culture, but we're focusing on Black men this month. And if you don't know about Charles Drew, please look him up. He also was part of Omega Psi Phi fraternity. When we talk about the Black Greek organizations, I belong to Delta Sigma Theta, and those are brothers and sisters, unofficially, but we're brothers and sisters to each other. So me belonging to um, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Charles Drew was a member of the Omega Psi Phi um, Fraternity Incorporated. So really understanding that, and please look up these gentlemen, okay? Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to that. Now we're gonna move forward with our program. Next slide, please. Priscilla, it's back to you. You're on Thank mute. You. Thank you, Dr. Sab. That was great. Um, it's always good to hear history from our heritage. We know we don't get enough of it, so we really appreciate that. Um, now, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, um, Dr. Dale McBride, and his talk that he's going to give us entitled HIV and Other STDs, Statistics, Treatment, and Prevention, a Focus on Black Men's Health. Dr. Darren McBride is an infectious disease physician at the Geisinger Medical Center in Danville, PA, and specializes in HIV treatment, management, and prevention. Dr. McBride is currently on the board for the AIDS Resource Center in Williamsport, PA, and was recently selected to be on the Ending HIV as an Epidemic Working Group, a national committee dedicated to aid ending HIV. He is the co-chair of the Black Outreach Leadership and Development ERG at Geisinger. He is now the new Regional Assistant Dean of Student Affairs for Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine for the Danville campus. And currently he is the program director for the very new Ryan White program at Geisinger. It's my pleasure to introduce him and I will stop sharing so he can share his slides with us. All right, can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Right. Thank you so much. So um, this is my talk on uh, HIV and other STDs. So I'm gonna focus mostly on stats and prevention. And my hope is that uh, <laughs> we don't have to get to the treatment phase. So I'm gonna, you know, pile down on that a little bit. Let me see. So I'm gonna start with HIV. So here's national epidemiology. So the CDC actually did a, um, um, a review uh, looking at the lifetime risk of HIV throughout a bunch of different transmission groups. Uh, this was done in 2015 and came out in 2016. Um, so as you can see here, MSM, meaning men who have sex with men, was one in six, women who inject drugs, one in 23 men, men who inject drugs, one in 36 heterosexual women, one in 241, and heterosexual women, in one in 43. And when you look at the category of men who have sex with men by race and ethnicity, you can see that African-American men um, have a one in two chance or lifetime risk of HIV. So 50% likelihood of acquiring HIV in their lifetime, which is atrocious. Um, Hispanic men were one in four and white, white uh, MSM and uh, was one in 11. As you can see here, if you just look at race and ethnicity, African-American men still float to the top in one out of 20, um, followed by African-American women, one out of 48 Hispanic men, et cetera, et cetera. So um, when you actually look at uh, the uh, entire uh, United States, you can see Pennsylvania is not in the low risk category, <laughs> one in 115. Um, and uh, when you look at uh, those who actually are at highest risk of acquiring HIV, um, if you look at uh, the ages, it's between 20 and 40, which is typically um, the highest sexual um, age, the young people. OK. When you look at it, uh, new HIV diagnoses uh, among adults and adolescents, 
um, and this is the most recent data in 2018, you can see that African Americans again are at the top of the list there. Um, and then when you look at transmission group, um, when you have uh, nationally, uh, men who have sex with men are in the highest transmission group category. Now, I want you to pay attention to the national data uh, because when I get to the state of Pennsylvania, it's gonna be different. And that's important, that distinction is important. Um, so uh, new diagnoses among um, uh, adults and adolescents, um, if you're looking at the 2018, which is the newest, um, you can see that Pennsylvania is number nine. So we are not, again, out of the uh, high risk zone. And again, uh, when you look at this, um, at this age distribution, um, you know, you're far more likely to acquire um, HIV between the ages of 20 and 40. And that's really, really important. Those are where the highest percentages are, even, even across all of the, um, all of the uh, years from 2013 to 2018. So when you get to Pennsylvania, um, what you can see is that things are actually a little bit more uh, equally distributed. <laughs> so if you compare white and African-American acquisition of these are um, number of cases of HIV diagnoses um, between 2013 and 2018, it's actually quite close between male and female when you look at the actual, uh, in the male category, when you look at the um, percentage breakdown. Um, it's a little bit different. It's higher um, in uh, uh, female Af uh, African-American. When you look at the number of cases in the state, again, this is just reflective of what you saw nationally. So it's really that age population of like around 20 to 40. So this is just, this is just uh, emphasized yet again. When you look at the trend of uh, new HIV diagnoses, you can see here that really that 20 to 40 um, sort of category is still at the highest risk. Um, and when you look at men who have sex with men versus heterosexual contact, they're actually far more even than seen nationally, right? So this is, again, the most recent data um, in the state of Pennsylvania going from 2013 to 2018. So uh, distribution of young adults with HIV, um, uh, HIV positive cases, I don't think this surprises very many people. Um, the dark blue area, which are the highest um, number of new uh, cases, again, happen in the Philadelphia, Pittsburgh area, and then it sort of disseminates out from there. Um, but when you look at HIV cases by age and uh, race and ethnicity, as in, 2000, in 2018, which is the most recent data, you can also see that African Americans um, are at the top of this list as well, the number of cases. Um, when you look at other STDs, and again, this is national data because national data actually um, syncs up with Pennsylvania quite nicely. Um, as you can see here, and this is the most recent um, surveillance that was done, which is the 2019 data. Um, and from two, uh, and compared to 2015, congenital syphilis has gone up <laughs> by 279%. <laughs> Chlamydia has gone up 19%. Syphilis has gone up 74% and gonorrhea has gone up 56%. Now, when you look at these numbers, and again, this is the new, newest data that's out, um, and you break it down but, uh, by race and ethnicity, um, you can see that, again, Blacks come to the top, followed by uh, um, uh, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, and then under that, um, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders. Same thing with gonorrhea. Same thing with primary and secondary syphilis. Same thing with congenital syphilis, except here, um, you know, uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives sort of uh, float to the top above African Americans there. Um, when they break it down again, according to sex, and you're looking at the difference between male and female, and again, this is a rate per 100,000, um, you can see that um, males and female um, uh, African-Americans are at the highest, or, um, are the highest rates of uh, infection with chlamydia. Uh, same here with gonorrhea. 
Same here with primary and secondary syphilis, far more uh, leaning toward the male side. And there's a reason for this, right? And we don't wanna look at statistics without really looking at um, why these things are and why these populations sort of float to the top in each time. So there's been a history of uh, human experimentation during slavery, right? So the history of e experimentation is as old as the practice of medicine itself. It is always targeted, disadvantaged, marginalized, and vulnerable populations. And slaves were easy targets for ambitious and entrepreneurial white physicians in the slave South. Slaves um, as a human commodity were readily transformed into a medical resource. So all of the key training networks and power bases of Southern, Southern medicine were operated by and through the exploration, uh, exploitation of black bodies. Um, apprenticeships, private practice, colleges, hospitals, journals, societies, they all participated. Um, white medical students as a matter of, uh, of a course really um, uh, it were expected, uh, expected education and training based on the observation, dissection, and experimental treatment of multiple slaves. Um, under slavery, there was, uh, there was also an extensive network of specialist Negro hospitals, and these hospitals were often the sites of risky medical uh, procedures and research, and were closely linked to slave traders anxious to patch up their quote-unquote livestock. So to the, the Tuskegee experiment, right? So the Tuskegee experiment was an experiment that began from 1932 to 1972. Um, at the time, there was no known treatment for syphilis. And after being recruited with the promise of free medical health care, 600 men um, originally were enrolled in the project. The participants were primarily sharecroppers from Macon County, Alabama, and many had visited the doctors before. Oh, I had never seen a doctor before. Um, so doctors from the U.S. Public Service, um, they were running this. So this was sanctioned by the U.S. government. Um, they had 300 men in the latent, uh, diagnosed with latent syphilis and 201 men who were disease-free and they were considered the control group. Um, the PHS um, worked with Tuskegee University, um, a historical black university in Alabama for enrollment in this study. Uh, and they were told um, they were being uh, treated for bad blood, which was really a nonspecific term. It was generalized um, and used for a number of ailments at that time. So there was real no dis there was no real disclosure of what they were being treated for or what was going on. So uh, the men were monitored by healthcare workers and um, only given placebos. Um, even though penicillin became a recommended treatment for syphilis in 1947. Uh, the PHS researchers actually convinced local physicians in Macon County not to treat the participants in order to monitor the disease and see how it progressed. Um, so in order to track the, uh, really in order to track the, the, the disease's full progression. So these men who were inflicted and not treated either died, went blind, went insane, um, because syphilis can actually cause um, a meningitis and infect your brain and actually lead to personality changes um, and dementia, um, or experimented other severe, uh, severe health problems due to untreated syphilis. Uh, in 1972, 28 uh, participants had either died from syphilis, 100 more had passed away from complications related to syphilis, and 40 spouses had been diagnosed and 19 children were born with congenital syphilis. So this really leads us down the path of medical mistrust, right? What does that really mean? So that's the tendency to distrust institutions of medicine, including personnel and clinicians um, who represent the dominant culture. And as a result of the past and present discrimination and racial, racial persecution, many medical conspiracies, conspiracies have evolved. And I really hate to use the term conspiracy um, because it's really based in fact, right? These things really happened. Um, uh, these theories perpetuate medical mistrust. So um, as, a more, as we advance more in medical technology, right? Trust becomes the foundation on which our healthcare system is built. Patients understand medicine less and less, and they rely on their physicians more and more to help them because things get more and more complicated. Um, so given that patients are often in vulnerable positions, the lack of trust can lead to very poor outcomes 
And it's really the presence of medical mistrust in the African-American community and a mixture of historical events, some of which I've shown just now, um, and continued personal experiences and the complex interplay of these two issues in addition with other socioeconomic factors, which really lead to the statistics that I just showed you. So, um, you know, is there any basis in this, right? So have, has anyone really looked into this? So um, in a community-based sample that was done, 70% uh, of African-Americans um, believe that the government was hiding information and not really telling the truth about the HIV epidemic. Um, the belief that medical institutions use African-Americans, that's quote unquote, guinea pigs for scientific research was a prevalent notion. And this has really led to two major HIV related conspiracies that are present in not only an African-American community, but the Latino, Asian, and also the white communities as well. Um, and that's the uh, genocidal theory and the treatment theory. So the genocidal theory are notions that HIV is a man-made virus created and spread by the CIA um, and the cure is being held from the poor. Now, if anybody has ever heard about anything associated with HIV, I feel like you've heard someone say something along those lines because I personally have. Um, and the treatment theory, right? So notions centered around uh, the belief that the new medications are actually there to progress the HIV disease um, and get people closer to AIDS. Um, and uh, uh, taking those new medications, they're really guinea pigs for the government to really uh, experiment on them. Right. So these beliefs have a negative correlation in the African-American community regarding condom use and each, um, HIV testing as well, all right? So the prevalence, the prevalence of these beliefs was a significant predictor of unprotected sexual intercourse with HIV positive and unknown serial status partners. So that's an actual, that's actual literature based. Um, these beliefs and fundamental mistrust um, affects institutions promoting HIV prevention, detection, and treatment and decreasing the number of African-Americans who get tested and further decreasing the numbers who get treated. So also there's negative effect of stim uh, uh, stigma on the LGBTQIA plus community, right? So HIV risk, right? So HIV and AIDS were initially known as GRID, right? Which is gay related immunodeficiency syndrome. So there was an already association with being LGBT and having HIV. That's long um, uh, been established in the United States. So AIDS and HIV um, has been blamed for prom on promiscuity and promiscuousness within the gay community. There have been misconceptions regarding sexual promiscuity versus sexual practice, which I'll get into in a little bit. And the uh, most HIV infections are actually a require, uh, acquired through repeated sexual contact with an infected person. So what that means is these folk who acquire HIV are more than likely in relationships, um, and a majority of them really are. So these are people who are having unprotected sex with people that they trust sexually, which is something that we've all done before, and it's just a human thing. So um, typically, HIV infections are acquired from relationships, as I said. So uh, I really like this chart because it basically looks like exposure, right? So risk-related exposure based on sexual activity, right? So if you look down at the sexual part, which I've highlighted, you can see receptive anal intercourse is riskier than insertive anal intercourse. So if you're a receptive anal intercourse partner, what that means is you're the bottom, you're receiving the penetrating object, whatever that may be. Um, and then the insertive anal, um, anal intercourse person as the person putting the penetrating object in the anal cavity, right? So the top or the bottom in that relationship. And then the receptive penile vaginal intercourse, right, is farther down. So that is the bottom person, the female person typically in that relationship. And the insertive penile vaginal intercourse is the top, right? So what we've learned from looking at this is that receptive anal intercourse is highest risk sexually for uh, getting HIV, right? So it's not actually related to someone's sexual attraction, it's related to sexual practice. So it is the practice of anal intercourse that is the highest risk, right? Can heterosexuals have anal intercourse? Yes, they can, and they very much do. So it's not related to anything gay or, or, or LGBT or anything. It's related to sexual practice. 
stigma, right? So um, there's a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. So drastically, it drastically decreases um, a person's want to get tested for HIV. So compared to people who get tested, individuals who are not tested for HIV demonstrated significantly greater AIDS-related stigmas, ascribing greater shame, guilt, and social disapproval to people living with HIV. So what do we do, right? Uh, how do we really confront some of these issues? So, you know, you have to address the large elephant, right? So there's a big old white elephant sitting in your room. You need to talk about it. You can't ignore it, right? So address the stigma that's associated with HIV. Um, address the medical mistrust among African-Americans. Um, Reestablish trust and credibility in the medical institutions. That should be first and foremost, right? So a couple of ways to do that, and there are many more, trust me, is to provide accurate details about past injustices. Affirm the fact that these things happened. Right? So when patients come to you with quote unquote conspiracies, we have to understand that these things are based um, in actual happenings, that they're not made up. And these concerns are valid and we need to affirm those. So, um, you know, that really will bring awareness and issues of medical mistrust to the forefront. Culturally relevant education campaigns should be addressed, should address historical issues as well. Now, number two is acknowledge current cultural factors. So discrimination, racism, social stigma, and social determinants of health. These are how we address these issues um, adequately. And then educate, right? So government and, and uh, public health agencies should open have open discussions with African-American communities regarding um, and other minority communities um, regarding HIV acquisition, the data surrounding it. You know, be transparent and then uh, promote transparency of the topic of HIV, as I just mentioned. Okay, so then once you address the, the elephant, you address the room, right? Um, so the government will need to pour in additional funds in order to eradicate HIV. The current goal from the CDC and the IDSA is no new infections by 2030. That ain't happening right now, uh, uh, just based on predictions of how things are going. And before that, that was the goal in 2015, and we didn't make that either. So we'll see. So um, HIV and other STD prevention modalities, right? So, you know, prevention is really a concept, right? Um, it's understanding that there are people who are high risk, and it's also understanding that there are people who are actually carry the disease, and how do you prevent them from transmitting things to each other, right? So with the prevention of HIV and other STDs, you're really looking at preventing those at high risk. So using condoms, using PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, using NPAP, and that really covers all of STDs, to be honest. Stopping carriers from infecting. So it's getting people who are infected with HIV undetectable uh, because that basically eradicates their ability to um, transmit the disease and also using condoms as well. Um, and then that would lead to the eradication of new HIV infections and significant decrease in new STD infections in the United States. All right. So, you know, another thing is to get tested. That's another thing. Um, because many people do not get tested. And that's really the number one way to really decrease numbers is to know your status. So condoms, let's look at condoms. People preach about condoms. Let's talk about the utility of them. So, you know, really latex or polyurethane male condoms are highly effective against preventing HIV and other STDs when used correctly, and that's a big thing. Generally, uh, the, generally the effectivity of condoms is considered to be 80 to 94%, and that's not 100, right? And that's when they're used correctly with the right lubrication, um, at the right temperature. They haven't been sitting in your pocket for seven years. They have an expiration date on them. There's so many things to consider there. Um, and people who report using condoms consistently reduce their risk from getting HIV, and this is per the CDC, um, by 63% as an insertive anal sex partner, or as a receptive anal sex partner, they reduced it on average to 72% vaginal sex, 80%, and uh, condoms were much less likely um, to be effective if they were used inconsistently. And they even gave a pretty good frame of inconsistency. They said consistent is 75% or greater, right? So that's pretty, that's a pretty large gap. 
Um, however, this is the only protective modality that we have that's effective against almost all STDs. And I said almost all because not all STDs are prevented from just condom use. That's why it's really important to get tested. Right, so what is PrEP? So PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, it's using HIV medication in an HIV negative person prior to their uh, exposure. Truvada was the first FDA approved medication for HIV um, uh, prevention use. Uh, let's talk about Truvada for a little bit. So it's been around since 2004. We have a lot of safety data on it. Um, it's FDA approved for HIV treatment and subsequently um, uh, for uh, HIV prevention. It's tr uh, Truvada is a combination um, pill consisting of tenofovir, dasoprosil, fumarate, and intracytabine, which are two antiretroviral medications. Um, and it's safe to use in pregnancy. Over 9 million is, I think it's closer to like 12 million people now, but over, uh, uh, over 9 million people worldwide are on this medication. And then, uh, you know, what can happen? What are some of the side effects? Around 10% like has some nausea and vomiting in the first two, four weeks, but that generally resolves. Less than 1% have some elevation in their creatinine levels, which is um, an estimate of your kidney function, but that generally goes away. And then there's a very rare condition called Fanconi syndrome, which is very, very rare, unlikely to happen. And then they also have subclinical bone density loss. Um, so leading to osteopenia, osteoporosis. So Discovy is the second drug that was FDA approved, okay? That was approved October, 2019. Um, and Discovy is an HIV medication um, combination drug that consists of two medications, tenofovir, alafenamide, and intracytabine. And it's not a big difference between Truvada and Discovy. They're very, very similar, except for the tenofovir element. The tenofovir element is actually less bioavailable, which, which that means it doesn't go everywhere in the body, right? It sort of stays where it's supposed to stay. So it actually causes less side effects. Um, so FDA approved this for HIV treatment in 2016 and subsequently for PrEP use um, in 2019. And so Truvada is a combination pill as with the medications I said before. Um, and then the DISCOVER trial was found to be non-inferior, meaning it was just as effective as Truvada when they were used head to head. So it's less likely to cause bone density loss and less likely to cause renal dysfunction. Um, and it's only approved for cisgender men and transgender women. That's super shady, but women, biological women, were not included in that study. So if a female wanted to get um, uh, PrEP right now, it would be Truvada and not Discovy. And it's a smaller pill size. So like, you know, why do we use it? How effective is it? Um, so this is a great thing. You can peruse it if you want to, but I really like to get to the meat. This is like my favorite slide. So if you think about clinical trials, this is like the Beyonce of clinical trials, the IPEC study. I mean, she's on time, she sings down, you know, she's doing splits and car wheels. Like this is what you want, right? So, um, you know, the IPREC study was a multinational, double-blinded, randomized clinical trial um, that um, put two high-risk populations head to head. One got a placebo, which is a sugar pill. The other one got a uh, Truvada medication. What they showed is that between the two groups, there was an overall 44% reduction. However, in patients that uh, had detectable drug in their blood, so they use like spot testing to actually measure if they had detectable drug levels in their blood, um, what they found is those people who did have detectable drug levels in their blood took it around 50 to 75% of the time, and they actually had a 92% reduction in the acquisition of HIV. So there was a 92% risk reduction, which is pretty huge. Now, in the United States, we recommend people take it 100% of the time, every single day, not 50 to 75% of the time. So it's further extrapolated that there's a 95 to 99% reduction um, in risk of HIV acquisition. Right, so the IPREX trial, it's an amazing trial. Look at the quality of evidence is high. The CDC says it. you don't have to believe me if you don't want to, you know, the governing body says it was amazing. Truly the Beyonce of uh, <clears throat> clinical trials. So that's where we get most of our data from. Now, as you can see, there's a bunch of other ones and that's why they're included here. So who is this really for? So men who have sex with men. So, you know, despite 
us going back and forth. Transgender women are included there. Um, you know, homosexual women and bisexual women, and then heterosexual women and women with high risky sexual behavior. So the CDC doesn't define that well, but I've defined that sort of for you. So a history of you know five to ten sexual partners in one month no monogamous relationship and highly sexually active or poor condom compliance. And then intravenous drug users, um, history of drug treatment program, and then shared needles in the past six months. I mean, that's a lot of them, so they, they can be included. And then HIV discordant couples, so HIV positive partner and HIV negative partner. And really anyone who's had an STI in the last six months or anyone who feels they're at high risk. So it's not like someone's gonna come to you as a primary care doctor and say, hey, um, you, know, I've, you know, I've been having sex with these 15 people on a first meet and tell you all of their sexual history. That's not an expectation. So for me, if a patient walks into my clinic and says, I need PrEP, I'm gonna believe them because clearly they know they have some risk factors that they're not telling me. So I'm the barrier of least resistance. And so again, all patients must be HIV negative. So who is PrEP for? Anybody who wants it. Now, this is a really good trial because this looked at like how forgivable is PrEP adherence. So I already mentioned that there was a 92% reduction um, in people who took it 50 to 75% of the time, but this even corroborated that. So there is forgiveness in, in patient adherence. So if they miss a couple of days, that's okay. Four pills per week were, uh, were pretty effective. Um, greater than 90% risk reduction still there. So do I promote that? No, I don't, but it's just good for uh, to think about. So do you still need to use condoms with breasts? Yes, you do. Uh, PrEP does not protect against all SCDs, clearly HIV, right? Uh, HIV is it. Um, HIV and other SCDs. So SCDs actually increase the risk of spreading HIV. So HIV positive persons are more likely to shed HIV. Um, if they have urethritis from gonorrhea or chlamydia or a genital ulcer from herpes or syphilis, to be honest. Herpes is um, commonly associated with HIV. Um, persons infected with herpes are three times um, uh, increased risk for HIV. And treating STDs has not been shown to prevent HIV alone. So just me treating your syphilis, just me treating your gonor gonorrhea or chlamydia doesn't mean that you won't get, it doesn't really help you with your HIV risk. So you need to wear condoms. So HIV and syphilis are really best friends. If you think about it, they, you know, hold each other at night. You know, they walk hand in hand down the street. You know what I mean? If, if somebody can't finish their drink, you know, HIV takes it up. You know, they're really hand in hand. So, you know, really the most amazing part about this um, is you got to look at Florida. I mean, Florida is something else. But in 2010, in Florida, among all persons diagnosed with syphilis, 42% were also diagnosed with HIV. <laughs> And then, you know, men, this is also in Florida, by the way, men who get syphilis are at higher risk. So among HIV me negative men in Florida in 2003 with syphilis, 22%, which HIV positive by two, 2011. So these are really important things that you need to know. So do you need to use condoms with PrEP? Yes, for the love of God. So there is another thing, post-exposure prophylaxis, and really this is used in acuity right after you've been exposed to HIV. You have a 72-hour window to take this. Each, um, its effectivity is basically decreased by 33% every day that you uh, wait. That's why that's what that 72-hour um, uh, window is about. So if you take post-exposure prophylaxis in 24 hours, it's like 90 to 99%. In 48 hours, it's 60 to 66. In um, 72 hours, it's 30 to 33. And then after that, there's no data. So we don't give it after 72 hours. So it's really important after a high risk exposure to come to an ER or something like that to get this medication. So um, what about the HIV positive folk, right? So undetectable equals untransmissible, right? So people with HIV, you know, can, with the newer HIV medication, can reduce the amount of virus in their blood and body fluids um, to a very low level. And this is called viral suppression, technically less than 200 copies. HIV medication can also bring the virus viral load down so much that you can't detect it. And that's called undetectable. It's less than 20. Um, and then people who take HIV medication as prescribed 
um, get and stay virally suppressed or undetectable have effectively no risk of transmitting HIV to an HIV negative partner, even with unprotected sex, okay? So untransmissible equals unde undetectable equals untransmissible, really important thing to say. Um, that's the reason why HIV positive moms um, who are on HIV medication, take it every single day, do not transmit to children, okay? And that's why we've been able to reduce infections. So if you don't believe me, listen to the CDC, look at this number. So taking aren't and virally suppressed, transmission rate zero. Statistically, it's real hard to get to zero, but they did it in this one. So what I need you to know is that this is a real thing. And look at the, the number of people who were included, 565. Thousand. So uh, this is really good evidence here. So um, transmission risk, so transmission with oral, anal, vaginal, effectively none, um, pregnancy, labor, delivery, 1% or less, and that's because they don't have enough people, but it's basically nothing. Sharing needles is unknown. They haven't really been able to do that data, um, but it's, it's still considered to be fairly high risk. And then breastfeeding. So substantially reduced, but not completely eliminated. And that's because um, the medication doesn't penetrate the breast tissue as well as you would really want it to. So in the United States, it's actually recommended that HIV positive moms do not breastfeed, okay? Now, if you were to go outside of the country to a, uh, to a country that's maybe third world or doesn't really have good water supply, formula is really not an option, right? So in those countries, you would see the WHO recommend that breastfeeding is okay in those countries because the child dying, dying from cholera is way more likely than them getting HIV. Does that make sense? Awesome. So here's some resources that you can look up. I'm happy to go back to them. That's me and my uh, uh, collaborators, uh, Dr. McKenzie and Dr. Gautham. Um, she does P's ID, Dr. McKenzie does adult with me. Um, and I have an Instagram for um, uh, HIV information. Um, and that's it. So if you have any questions or comments or anything, um, please let me know. I'm open to all questions at this time. I went over a lot of stuff, I know. Yeah, so thank you for that presentation. Uh, uh, some members of our, our biomedical research club, a bunch of students were looking at PrEP in Medicaid. And if they were extracting the data right, they were showing that like Truvada um, in a lot of states had gone down to almost nothing. And then that second generation agent that you you mentioned, mm -hmm. that was really, really high. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm still getting a handle on Medicaid. So do you think that there's like state policies that really discourage you know, the use of that older agent? Is there something about cost or is there really, it didn't seem like there was huge advantages for the newer agents relative to the older ones. So there are um, more advantages. So there are less side effects for yeah. like long-term use. And when you're thinking about someone who's young, right? Um, you're thinking about someone who's high risk, 1920. I really don't re want to uh, start affecting your bone density. You're still growing. So for those who are very, very young, um, it's actually, um, well, okay, so I have inside information, but the guidelines aren't out yet. They're actually going to be promoting Discovy use for that particular reason um, in younger populations. Um, older populations, it may not be so bad, right? Um, uh, but for younger populations, they're going to preferentially move to Discovy. Okay. Um, for that particular reason. So, I mean, there's not a huge difference between the two other than maybe si longitudinal uh, side effect profile. All right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, on that front, I can sort of bang off of that if you want to. There are new medications coming out for PrEP too, which are gonna be super awesome. So I attended CROI, which happened in March of this year, um, and uh, Cabotegravir, which is a integrase inhibitor is uh, injectable, um, is actually gonna be coming out probably by the end of this year. Again, those are gonna be highlighted in the newer guidelines that are supposed to come out soon too. So cabotegravir is an injectable um, uh, HIV medication. And actually you only have to take it, it looks like based on the data that's coming out, once every two months. So it's an injectable once every two months drug that's gonna be okay for men and women, doesn't matter, because they, they included everybody in that trial. And, um, and uh, uh, it's gonna be, uh, it is gonna be prevention or it's gonna work really well at preventing HIV, probably better than the oral medications, which is quite surprising. So um, 
uh, that's coming out. And then there's another oral medication coming out called it's, it's Latrivir, which is a new HIV medication. And that's actually one pill once a month use for um, uh, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, what they've been doing, what, what the um, you know, drug folk have been doing is been pairing new HIV medication that's been coming out with all, and also doing uh, a parallel PrEP use at the same time. So a lot of these indications are gonna be coming out at the same time at this point, which is pretty awesome. We have Dr. McBride. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna read a couple questions I've seen in the chat. I want to thank you for the presentation also. Thank and I, my comment was that I, the stats that you showed were kind of crazy to me. I, right. you know, so um, Zanet asked, do you believe that the SCOVI will one day spread their wings and try a research study on how effective um, the pill in biological women is? Wow, okay. So yes, I think they're undergoing that right now, but there's a little bit shade with that too, if you want me to be honest. So um, the distribution of the drug is different in men versus women because of fat content, right? Women have more adipose tissue or fat tissue than men do. And what they actually found with Truvada is that it takes a long time to get therapeutic levels in women. Um, and the drug company, I'm pretty sure, wanted to get this Discovy FDA approved as soon as possible. So what they did was they decided to cut women out of the new drug, knowing what happened with the old drug, right? So that they could get FDA approval and get their coin first and then go back and do women later. So I think that's sort of what happened there. And th that's pretty, I mean, it's shady, but, you know, they want to get their money, you know. We have a another question in the chat. Um, are you familiar with the Temple research that is searching for the cure for HIV? And that was from Olivia. So um, I am familiar with many different, I mean, that's international. So, um, you know, it's not just, it's not just Temple. And part of, part of the problem with eradicating HIV is that nobody knows where the reservoir is. That's the big question. Like once you're undetectable, there's still a lot of evidence that shows that there's still minute, you know, viral replication going on, okay? And they don't know exactly where that happens. Does it happen in regular tissue? Does it happen in lymph tissue? And if you can't target something, how do you destroy it? And that's really the problem. You know, the people who have been cured, because there have been a few of them, are people that have had their entire immune system wiped out and then had someone else's immune system put back. These are people who have um, been going through transplant, right? So is that realistic for real people? No, because HIV treatment is far less risky and you can live your life like normal versus getting your entire immune system eradicated and then having to be on immunosuppressants for the rest of your life. That's not a realistic tactic for cure. So um, I think part of the issue with um, you know, really getting to the crux of um, uh, a cure for HIV is where is it when it's the volume is really low? Where are you hiding still? And how do we kill you off? And they still don't know the answer to that, but I think they're getting closer and closer each day. There's another question from Jaeger. How affordable are these medications and uh, are they widely available in third world countries where HIV rates are highest? Right. So, you know, um, that is a really, really great question. So th there's also, um, Oh, there's so much sort of um, on top of that. So um, actually a lot of third world countries, you'd be very surprised at their HIV um, suppression rates. So like Ghana and um, my goodness, uh, um, a, few, a few other countries, God, um, it's gonna Rwanda uh, um, or no, there's, I mean, there's a few different countries that literally have better suppression rates than the United States. The United States press, um, suppression rate overall for all HIV in the United States as of 2019, which is the latest data, is 56% suppression rate. So that means that like, you know, 40-ish people are out there just still not suppressed, potentially spreading. Where like other countries, who are third world actually get 100% funding 
um, from outside their country and have been able to get viral suppression rates to like 95%. It really depends on what you care about and who it affects, right? So in other countries outside of the United States, um, you know, everyone's affected. Heterosexual, homosexual, it's actually less likely for you to have HIV if you're homosexual in other countries um, than it is to be heterosexual because that's the dominant you know, way that you're gonna get it. So if it's something that's in everyone, you're gonna put more money to do that thing. Does that make sense? Versus in the United States where it sort of hits a smaller population who you may not care the most about. So where are you gonna put your money and your effort in, right? So when it comes to things like that, it, when it comes to HIV, yeah, they don't have the um, a myriad of drugs that we have in other countries, but they have policies in place to make sure people get treated appropriately. And do all of those policies exist in the United States? No, they don't, okay? And that's part of the problem that we have right here. So it really comes down to what you really care about. So not all drugs are available in other third world countries. They aren't. We have tons of drugs and we get them first. Um, but uh, they don't have, they, some places don't even have like TAF or anything like that. We get really a, a lot of the newer combinations quite quickly. Um, but our ability to disseminate these things are uh, lacking. So I hope maybe that answered your question um, a little bit. So um, PrEP is available in other countries and probably a little bit more like easier to get almost because it affects everyone. Thank you, um, Dr. McBride. We have a few more questions in the chat and we have, I think maybe about 10 more minutes. So we'll go through those now. Um, we have one from Peace that states, are there medications available upon request? Um, if contact is suspected, can you ask for it from the ER or from a primary care physician? And then I think a sub, sorry, Dr. McBride, no, a sub question to that also from Brian is, or even from a pharmacist. And before you answer that, can we stop sharing the screen so we can see the entire oh, gallery? Oh, yeah. And Let me stop thank it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sapp. Absolutely. So um, oh, let me try to answer this question really well. So it depends on what angle you're coming from. If you're coming from the pre-exposure sort of realm, um, then um, it, it, you may be talking about PrEP on demand. I'm not entirely sure. PrEP on demand um, is basically the incentivized process where if you know you're gonna do something high risk that night, I can give you a dose of PrEP the day of, right? And then you take two after, and that decreases the likelihood that you get HIV quite nicely. Um, PrEP on demand exists in areas that can really provide that. PrEP on demand is something where you have to have availability to 24 seven. In rural areas like where we have right now, it's not really a feasible thing. A lot of our pharmacies don't even have HIV medication on stock because there's not enough clientele to have that medication. And these medications are very expensive. So they have to go through special pharmaceutical companies or uh, processes. And that can be um, a little bit difficult, honestly. It really can be um, out here, I would say. But that sort of prep on demand, and you can Google prep on demand as well. Google has like tons of fantastic like visual representations of PrEP on demand, but uh, that works really well. If you're talking about post-exposure prophylaxis, so you've gotten a high risk sort of uh, encounter and you wanna go to an ED, that should be available in most functional emergency rooms. That's part of like the same process for rape victims. Um, and it should be available um, for anybody who ha who's had sexual contact, which is questionable. So that should be available in most um, emergency departments. We have um, a comment from James. It says, I saw an article somewhere where it says there's a possible HIV vaccine coming in the future. Does that play into what you said to Olivia's question? So, um, you know, they've been working on an HIV vaccine for a very long time. Um, so, that would be nice. I know that they're doing um, trials for it now, but I, I have not been able to see how effective they've been. The, so far from what I've seen in the literature, effectivity of um, uh, HIV vaccination has been pretty poor. Um, so, but we'll see. I mean, th there could be something coming out, but if, if it's, 
I mean, if it's not close to like 80 to 90 percent, I sort of I sort of like not a huge fan. Um, a lot of them have been like 30 and 40 percent, not very good. So um, I'll, I'll have to check into that. But I haven't seen anything in the literature and I review it quite often that had anything um, amazing coming out. Thank you. I think, Red, Jerry, you had a question for Dr. Yes, I don't know if um, you talked about Dr. McBride, but I've heard that people with HSV-1 um, can possibly transmit um, HSV-2 to someone um, through oral sex. Um, I was wondering like how, how likely is that, how possible is that, or if you can even have HSV-1 um, within yourself and that gets transmitted to HSV-2 without having contact with somebody else. Well, um, HSV, I'm, t I'm assuming you're talking about herpes simplex virus, right? Yes. Right, HSV1, they're, they're actually different. So HSV1 and HSV2 are different. Um, HSV1 is associated with like oral pharyngeal infections. HSV2 typically is associated with, um, you know, the crotch area, the groin area.